Well, last day of 2023. Probably some of you that are here this morning, or some are listening online, are saying, you know, I'm kind of glad <laughs> that this is the end of this year. Looking forward to a new year, maybe uh, new things on the horizon, but God has been faithful this year, and God will prove to be faithful in the year ahead. Uh, Matt and Amy and the kids are getting a chance to get away uh, before it comes back and starts a new series starting next week. Going to be starting a series in the book of Ephesians uh, entitled People on Purpose. So I thought this morning I would share with you a message I'm going to call Positioning Yourself for 2024. Position Yourself for 2024. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, my habit is, and I trust that your habit is also each day, to start the day in the Word of God. And God, uh, I take time to read through His Word, and uh, His Word speaks to me uh, each and every day, truths and really encouragement uh, that I need. And sometimes it's, um, you know, passages that I am very familiar with that all of a sudden God applies in a different way, speaks to me, you know, a different truth. Uh, applying it to my life and the time that I find myself. And this is one of those passages, very familiar with this passage, and maybe you also. But I want to use it maybe in a little bit uh, different way. So if you're already there, Second Chronicles chapter 20, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction, and then we're going to look at really the two main points that I want to stress this morning about putting yourself in a position where God can bless you and you can experience all that God has for you uh, in this coming uh, year. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray now, dear Lord, that you would bless as we gather around your word. I ask that you would speak to us afresh and anew. Dear Lord, help us not to assume that we know what your word says, but that we would allow your spirit, dear Lord, to speak to our hearts and our minds this morning new truths, maybe truths that we have already heard before but need to be reapplied to our lives, that we would position ourselves that you would be able to use us for your honor and glory and that we may experience, dear Lord, your blessings uh, in this coming year. So I pray, dear Lord, you anoint your word, help the words that I speak, dear Lord, would not be my own but would be yours. For I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let me give you a background if you're already there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. A familiar story. Uh, I'm going to put up on the, the board uh, behind us or the screen behind us a couple things about giving you the background all right, of the story. Uh, the first thing I want you to see is Joseph, he's the king all right, at this time. And we're going to look at Jehoshaphat's reality. Now, Jehoshaphat is the king in Jerusalem, and uh, before him, the nation had strayed away from God. And Jehoshaphat has come to the throne, and he has led the people back to God. In fact, in chapter 19, verse 9, he says, He commanded them, the people, saying, Thus shall you act in the fear of God faithfully and with a loyal heart. He taught them the word of God, instructed them in the word of God, the priest and the leaders, all right, there in Jerusalem, all right, that he ends up uh, getting the people back in pursuit of the Lord God. Now, instead of things getting better, all right, for Judah, the reality is, is that five enemy armies have united to now destroy the people of God. You look at that in verse 1, chapter 20. It said it happened after this, after the revival, after the people pursuing God, seeking to get their lives right before God, that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. You know what the reality is many times? We will determine within our hearts that we want to do what's right. We want to pursue God. We want to pursue righteousness. We want to be in the Word of God. We want to serve Him. Yet it seems, time, seems that many times when we make that decision, our life can fall apart. At least to us it looks like it. That things cannot get better, but things can get worse. 
All right? It seems that things be can become difficult. Circumstances can change. This was Jehoshaphat's reality. He has determined to do what's right, but yet now he is experiencing the possibility, at least in front of his eyes, that he would uh, experience defeat. So that's his reality, all right? Then also want you to see Jehoshaphat's reaction. What is his first reaction? His first rea And remember, he's a man of God, but yet he is like us. Because you look in verse 3, it says, and Jehoshaphat, what's that word? He feared. His first reaction was, even though he's a man who was following God, leading the people back to God, he sees this enemy coming against him, far out in numbers, all right, his people, he has fear within his hearts. And we need to understand, there's going to be times when we face situations we are going to be afraid, all right? It's nice to say that we should never be afraid, but there's going to be times that we will experience uh, fear. And the question is, not will I experience fear, but what will I do with that fear? So you see Jehoshaphat's reaction. Jehoshaphat, his request, all right, what does he do with that fear? In verse 3 and 4, he goes to God, and that's what we are to do. Look at verse 3. Jehoshaphat feared and said himself to seek the Lord God. He's afraid, doesn't know what to do. So he's going to seek the Lord God and proclaim the fast throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah that came to seek, all right, the Lord. What he did, he went to the Lord in prayer. He cast himself, he cast a nation on the faithfulness of God. And what he did, if you look at verse 9, he is claiming the promise of God. In verse 9, you see this promise that was given, all right, to the Lord through Solomon when the temple was dedicated. It says, if disaster comes upon us, whether sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in the temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save. Basically what Joseph had is doing is saying, Lord, you gave us this promise. We built this house to honor you and to worship you. And if enemies come against us, if we stand before you and claim this promise, you will be there for us. And this was Jehoshaphat's request that God would deliver him. See, his realization, Jehoshaphat's realization, is in verse 12. He says, O Lord God, will you not judge them? For we have no what? No power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to what? Do. But our eyes are upon you. In other words, he's proclaiming before God, being transparent. We don't have the power to meet this enemy army. We're far outnumbered, and I don't even know what to do. And I think all of us would, you know, have to acknowledge in our lives, when situations sometimes come into our lives that we, are, that we do not expect, not only do we not have the power all right, to meet what those situations require of us. But many times we don't even know what to do, all right, as we face those situations. And this is what Jehoshaphat is realizing. Now, God's response is in verse 15. And in verse 15, God tells Jehoshaphat and the people, he said, listen, all of you Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord God to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. Don't be afraid. Don't give up hope because of the circumstance you are in. Don't give up hope and live in fear because of what you are experiencing or what you are afraid might happen. He goes on, for the battle is not yours, but the battle uh, is the Lord. Don't be afraid. Understand the battle is not yours, it's God's. And then you see God's requirement. He said, I'm going to take care of this, but I am going to require something of you. All right? They are not to give in to fear. All right? 
And you notice what he tells them they need to do. Look at verse 17. He says, you're not going to need to fight this battle. But, he says, position yourselves, stand still. He said, there's a position you need to take. You're going to go out there on the battlefield, all right? You're going to position yourself, but you're not going to fight. And then you're going to stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. All right? And I would think if I was Joseph, I would think, wait a minute. I, I've explained to you, Lord, we're far, far outnumbered. I have no battle plan. I don't know what to do. And your answer is for me to go out to the battlefield and to stand there before this great army and stand still and everything will be okay. Okay. And, I, and Joseph had probably, at, at this point, would have to be a little confused, all right? They're not going to need to fight. God's going to require them to do something. Something that I find as a man is more difficult for me, all right? It's easier for me to battle and fight and do something, even if it's the wrong thing, than to stand still, all right? I've gotten a lot of trouble by doing things that I shouldn't do when God said to Bill, Bill, stand still and just don't say nothing right now. Don't do anything right now. Just wait upon me. Uh, I'm a little bit like King Saul, right? When God, when Samuel told him to wait, sometimes I got to take things in my hand. I have to do something. Well, they were to position themselves before the army, stand still. And as they stood still before the enemy, they would have the promise of God's presence. And he claimed the Lord would be with them. Now, today I'm looking at as we seek to follow our Lord in this year that's coming up, being true to his word, we see a vast host of satanic uh, forces coming against us. You think about it, all right? As a believer, I'm going to stand for him. I wrote down a couple here. As we look out, we see those that have forsaken absolute truth, all right, coming against the people of God. Truth is being rejected to fit within the reality that people have chosen for themselves. This is why we are under attack as Christians, because we believe in objective, all right, truth, all right, absolute truth, objective truth, and that truth is the what? Is the Word of God, the B-I-B-A-L-E. This is the book that we are to stand on. We are committed to the perfect, infallible Word of God as a foundation of truth, all right? And uh, we need to understand as we do this, we are in the crosshairs of the enemy. I, I saw a quote, I forget who it was on, on Facebook this week. Uh, don't expect the world to love you and to coddle you when they have crucified your master. So we see the forces of those coming against us that oppose absolute truth, and we're standing holding up the word of God. Also, as we look out, we see those that are redefining creation realities. The realities that God's Word uh, proclaims. We see this in gender confusion. You see it in confusing the roles of men and women in God's creation order. You see this in the re redefinition of what family is, redefinition of what marriage is. Also, we look out and we see an increasing number of those who outrightly reject God. All right, raid against us. I think Psalm 2 gives an accurate picture of the world in which we live in today. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3 says, Why did the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord, saying, And is anointed, let us break their bonds in pieces, let us cast away their cords from us. In other words, basically this world is saying, We will have no God but ourselves. Nobody is going to tell us what to do. Nobody's going to tell us what to believe. Nobody is going to have control over us. Uh, we reject this God. Individuals, nations, the psalmist says, are at war with God. They are at war with his Messiah. They are at war with his people, the Jews, and they are at war with who? Believers, Christians, who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We see the outright rejection 
of God's authority to rule over the affairs of men. Now, like Jehovah, we see all this going on, all right, in our nation. First reaction can be what? Fear or anxiety. In other words, what, what can I do? In other words, I'm far outnumbered. I have no power. Uh, I don't even know what to do if I could do it. Now, there's nothing wrong in experiencing fear for ourselves. I don't believe there's anything wrong in experiencing fear for our families and our loved ones. I look at what's going on in the world today. I have fear for my kids, my grandkids, and I have great-grandkids of where this world is going. There's nothing wrong with that fear. question is, what am I going to do with that fear? I cannot let fear rule in my life for this coming year. And like Jehoshaphat, we must cast ourselves in dependence upon God. So what I want to do this morning, when I was rereading this passage, uh, now it's about a month ago, all right, God drove two points home in my life as a believer, and I want to give them to you this morning. All right, two requirements, all right? Joseph is in this situation. I'm doing what's right. I'm trying to be a man of God. I'm trying to have the right influence on my family. I'm trying to have the right influence on my nation, and yet it seems like my world is falling apart. I'm in a situation I don't know what to do. And uh, God says, you don't have to do anything. Just trust me. But yet, he gives Joseph at two things that he has to do. All right? If he's going to experience God's presence and God's victory. Now, I know this. I want to experience God's presence in this coming year, 2024. And I want to experience God's power as I seek to live for him, all right, that will influence my children, my grandchildren, and those that are around me. And we have no excuse, I believe, all right, for not living, all right, in hope. There's no excuse for living in hopelessness in 2024. So the verse I want to look at, all right, verse 17, let me read it again. God tells Joseph, you do not need to fight the battle. But position yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow you go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So let me give you the first requirement. First requirement, he says, you need to position yourself. If you're going to see victory, if you're going to experience my presence in this situation, then you need to position yourself. Now, here's a thought God gave me. My background is sports in my early life, all right? And uh, whether it was baseball, football, and now still attempting to be able to play golf. One of the things I really learned as I played these sports is that your stance, all right, in those sports is very, very important. The wrong stance, all right, will keep you from reaching your potential. Wrong stance will make you very, very frustrated, all right? I can tell you that with golf, all right? Now, I think back of football, offensive lineman, a guard, all right? Three-point stance. What's important, and I would get down, but I couldn't get back up right now, so it ends up... When you took that three-point stance, you had to be very important to have a what? Balanced stance. Because that defensive guy is coming against you, and he's going to come with all his power, push up, all right, against your shoulders, and take you out of the way to get that quarterback. And if you're not balanced, guess what happens? Man, you just tip over very easily. So I learned I had to have the right position, the right balance, because the right stance and balance gave me leverage that I'm going to be able to adjust to what that guy's doing. But if I have no balance and I find myself on my BI, I'm not doing anything, all right? I'm no good to that offensive line. So I was thinking about football. Well, you know, stance is very, very important. Same way in baseball. If you ever played baseball, you're in the batter's box. I mean, just because you have power, doesn't mean you're going to hit that ball, all right, or that you're going to hit it, all right, out of the, out of the field where you're playing, right? Uh, you needed to have your feet, you know, wide apart, knees slightly bent, back slightly bent, hands near the back shoulder, chin over the front shoulder, belt buckle in the middle of the plate, but you had to have that stance. 
right stance, all right, is going to connect with that ball. And then golf. But that's another story, right? <laughs> Many people here play golf. That can be frustrating, can it? Right, I'm still working on the right stance. But the right stance is the foundation for your what? Your swing, all right? I, you know what's the most frustrating thing to me? I, I played golf most of my life. I caddied, all right, well, ever since I was 12 years old. Most frustrating, I still remember this one time, went to a country club with my son. It was somewhere up in Virginia, and they paired us with this 12-year-old boy. You know what it is to have a 12-year-old boy, you know, it's come out there and whip your, you know what, <laughs> down one side and down the other, all right? And you're a man, you know, in your 30s, right? And this boy out driving you. And the harder you tried, the worse you got. <laughs> Am I right? I just couldn't get that stance down. But I'm saying even in golf, you had to have the right stance. The truth is also, as God was driving this home to me, the truth is also as a believer, Bill, you got to put yourself in the right position. you got to have the right stance, all right? or you're not going to experience all that God has for you. A victorious life is lived from a proper stance or a proper position. In other words, it's one thing to say, well, I tried or I'm doing this. You know, you get out there with God, you're swinging all your mind. Sometimes the harder you try, the worse it gets and everything else. I mean, you have to have the right stance, all right, the right position if I'm going to experience the blessings of God. And like in sports, that's going to provide the stability and the balance I need in this coming year. Without it, you know what happens? We become frustrated. We become irritated. We give up, and we experience defeat. So I was thinking about this. Well, what is the right stance? All right, as I was, you know, having my devotions, let me give you three thoughts that God gave me, all right? The right the fundamentals of a right stance for a believer of this coming year. Number one, I have to acknowledge, all right, a position of personal weakness, all right? I have to acknowledge a position of personal weakness. You saw this in really 2 Chronicles chapter 20, all right? You see there in verse 12 where Jehoshaphat, the king, the supreme ruler, he has to acknowledge, I have no power, and I don't even know what to do. In other words, I have no power, no knowledge of even what to do. In other words, so Jehoshaphat, he ends up, we read the verses, goes to God in prayer. I'm in a dire situation, all right? I, of myself, I'm going to go down to defeat. I can't do it without you. And what he, why he went to God in prayer was because of this lack of power and this lack of wisdom. So we need to realize, I lack the power to face everything that's going to come against me in 2024. Man, it's great to, great to play this macho card, right? Us guys do. That. Man, I can handle whatever comes my way. No, you can't. All right? Not in the spiritual realm. You cannot of yourself handle everything that is going to come your way, all right? They had to acknowledge their need. They could not meet the need before them. They had no power in themselves. Isn't that what, I, you know, the first person I think about, I was thinking about was Jacob, right? Remember Jacob, right? The conniver, the deceiver. Man, he could handle any situation. He knew how to work the situation. He knew how to work people to come out on top. But remember, he had to learn a lesson, didn't he? All right? That his dependence needed to be upon God. He needed to lean on God, not himself. That's why you find in the book of Hebrews, when it talks about really men of faith, it says that Jacob, when he was dying, was leaning upon his what? Staff. Remember why that was? Because when he was crossing over the brook to meet his brother, remember he wrestled with the Lord, and his... Uh, Hip was put out of joint, and it says from that time forward, all right, he had to lean upon the staff. He had to lean upon God. Some, sometimes the greatest blessing is for God to put us in a situation that we have no other choice but to lean on him because we can't handle it ourselves. Isn't that what he did to the Apostle Paul? 
Paul had that thorn in the flesh. Lord, take, if you take this thorn away from me, I'm going to be able to do twice what I'm doing now. God says, nope, you're going to keep that thorn. Because with that thorn, you're going to lean upon me. All right, remember what he told the Apostle Paul. He ended up saying, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul said, therefore, I will now boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may reign all right, through me. So Joseph had to realize, you know what, I can't do it, but God can. But not only did he have to realize he lacked power, but he lacked wisdom. He didn't know what to do. In other words, what am I going to do? Have you ever been in a situation like that, even if you had some resources, you don't know what to do? In other words, you feel that, you know what, you should do something, but you don't know what to do. That's what the Word of God tells us. What in the book of Proverbs says, lean not on to your own, what, understanding, but all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. I'm saying, if I'm going to position myself for what's going to come my way this year, I have to acknowledge, you know what? I don't have the power myself to meet it. I can't. I don't, and I don't have all the answers. But I have a God. Isn't that what we just sung about, the goodness of God? I have a God that has the power I don't have. And I have God has the wisdom that I don't have. That's my stance. I don't stand in my power. I don't stand in my wisdom. I stand in the power of God and the wisdom of God. And I will experience then the victory of God. But I'm telling you, our tendency a lot of times, I can do it myself. I can go my, no, you can't. I need to acknowledge that. It's just, just like in sports sometimes. I get there, I'm, I'm, man, I got no, I'm just going to wail with that baby. I'm going to, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So first fundamental of believer stance, God to acknowledge a position of personal weakness. Second, we have to take a position of complete trust. Look at verse 20 of chapter 20. He says, so they rose early in the morning, all right, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and they went out. Joseph had a student said, hear me, O Judah, you inhabit of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you'll be established. Believe his prophets, or believe the word of God, and you will prosper. So they get up early to go out, to take their positions in a field that are vastly outnumbered and they don't even know what they're doing and they don't even know what God's going to do. That would have been a morning I would have slept in, all right? But it says they got up what? It says they got up early. You talk about trust. We must be persuaded God's going to be true to his word, right? The right stands. i got to be persuaded when I get into that batter's box, get that stand. God's going to be true to what he says. If they didn't believe that God was going to be true, they, they wouldn't have got up and went out there, right? They had to believe that God was going to give them the victory. Jehoshaphat and Judah would never have positioned themselves before a superior force unless they were persuaded of this. They were persuaded of the, of the power of God. Uh, there's a verse. I write down verses I had to memorize for myself. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope for he who promised is faithful. I got to hold fast my hope because guess what? It was given to me by the promises of Almighty God. Now, faith is more than just affirming God's going to be faithful, right? It requires action. See, I, I could have been one of those Israelites and said, well, you know, I, I believe God's going to be faithful. I believe God's going to be true. But I'm staying home today, <laughs> right? No, faith is more than just words. I got to take the responsibility to act on my faith one step at a time. And for that to be true, I have to have a growing faith each and every day. I can't, I can't live on yesterday's faith, all right? Here's what I realized. I used to, you know, whether it's working out, doing sports and everything else, it was, I was pretty strong at one time in my life. Can I tell you this? When you stop going to the gym and when you stop being active and then you look in the mirror, things change, right? That strength leaves you, right? And it kind of leaves you kind of quick, all right? 
It's just like faith. I can say, well, well, I remember years ago what God did through my life. And man, how I saw this, saw that. All you got to do is get out of the Word of God. Get out of fellowship with other believers. And I'm telling you, you find yourself in another position. It was very interesting here. Before they ever faced this situation, you know what Jehoshaphat was doing with his people? He was having the priest and the leaders teach the people the Word of God. And he's talking about believe the prophets. So all of a sudden, really what he's telling them now, now you're in a position, you have to believe and act on what you heard. It's one thing to sit, you know, in church or telling these people, one thing to sit, all right, around the temple and hear the word. Now, guys, guess what? Got to live it out. Got to act on it. You got to step out. By faith, you got to go out to that battlefield. Before this time of crisis, King had been leading his people in revival. Little did they know that that was preparing them for this crisis. All right? So what I'm saying, i got to take a position of complete trust. I have to trust God. I don't need to know everything he's going to do. I couldn't understand it anyhow. But I'm going to trust him. It's like I, I, I kid around when, when I was growing up as a boy. There was five of us brothers. Man, we cleaned out everything that was on that table. I don't remember once in my life as a young man, as a boy and a young man, that I ever worried, I wonder if dad's going to have supper and mom on the table. I just assumed. I mean, we were their kids, and it was up to them to have the food out there, and our job was to eat it, right? And it ends up, I have a God who's given me birth into his family. I can trust him. In other words, I don't need to understand every way he operates. I got the luxury of a child. I got a father Who's, who is beyond my comprehension, and he will be faithful. Let me give you a third thing about the fundamental of believer stance. And what that is, we have to have a position of unrestrained praise. Look at verse 21. And when he had consulted the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the enemy and they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Wait a minute, Joseph. You're not setting archers here, you know, when the guys with the swords here and, you know, the cavalry. You ever see a lot of those movies? And they're going to come down, you know, and going to do a flanking position. No, we're going to have a choir. Oh, wait a minute here. You see all that enemy of those chariots? They're, they're coming at us and we're going to sing? <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. All right? But notice when the praise began, it was when the victory, all right, happened. And what was the praise focused on? The great victory that they experienced? No. The battle hadn't even begun. They were praising the Lord and His mercy. Their focus was on the Lord their God and Him alone. Caught the attention of God. See, what we're prone to, we'll praise God after He does what, he, what, what we want Him to do. And really, it's not praise. It's just like we're showing a little gratitude. Thank you, you know, for doing what you, you should be doing. We're thinking, all right? But here, true praise is focused on the Lord, not their circumstances. And uh, if you have him, that would be able to praise God no matter what. I run out of time, but i got to give you this last one. So number one position. Number two is stand still. This is a tough one, right? You position yourself. Once Israel put themselves in the position God directed, they were instructed to stand still. Stand still in a vulnerable position. You're standing before the army that's coming to kill you, right? He says, you just stand still. And they're coming closer and closer. Very interesting, all right? The Hebrew word that's used here, similar meaning as the word that's used in Exodus 14.23. If you remember, Israel was leaving Egypt. Pharaoh changed his mind. Armies of Pharaoh were coming against them. They're pinned against the Red Sea. Moses ended up telling them, do not be afraid. Stand still. Oh, man, yeah, just stand still. Ocean behind me. Army in front of me to kill me. He says, stand still and you will see the salvation of God. It was here they would learn, right? And in fact, even this is what the people need to learn here. You learn two things, all right? You're not in charge, and you're not God. When you stand still, you, you realize things real quick, all right? You're not in charge. You're not calling the shots, 
and you're not God. One of the most difficult things for us to do is to stand firm in the midst of danger. We have the tendency to panic. Am I right? Three most common words in times, all right, uh, of, of crisis. And this is the people of God. God, do something. God, do something. God, do something. You got to do something, right? We end up saying this. And it's against our nature to stand still, all right, in the midst of trial. We're not patient. We have no patience. Am I right? We can't stand still. We have a tendency to panic. I wrote down some verses here. Samuel to the nation of Israel when he was given advice to Saul. He says, now then stand still and see the great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. We're, the verse I just read, all right, again to uh, Israel as they're trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. All right? To David, all right, fleeing from Absalom, be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. To King Hezekiah, who was believed that wrote Psalm 46, uh, again, as the army was, another army, the Syrians were coming against him, he says, be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 62, 5, again, by David, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. So what I'm saying this morning, this is what God was telling me, all right? Bill, you need to get the right stance, all right, 2024. You need to get the right stance. You need to position yourself, all right? Position yourself with dependence, all right? Rely on my power, my presence, Persu uh, position uh, persuaded, all right, of my power, that I am faithful, all right, in a position of praise. And then, Bill, stand still. Just stand still and trust me. I'm going to close with this quote by Corey Tamboom. I love this quote. If you look at the world, you're going to be distressed this year coming up. If you look within, you're going to be depressed this year. But if you look up, you're going to be at rest. And I'm saying you take the right position, be still, and look up. God will be faithful. And at the end of 2024, just as we sung this morning, you're going to say, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. He was faithful like Israel did. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. I don't know the situation in each individual's life here this morning. Dear Lord, what circumstances you've allowed to come into their lives. But I know, dear Lord, we are very much alike. That we're faced with situations where we don't have the power and we don't have, dear Lord, the knowledge of what to do. But dear Heavenly Father, would you, by your grace, drive home the truth that our position is not to fight, dear Lord, the battle, but is to position ourselves before you that you can fight for us and that you can win the victory. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that each one of us this year coming up, that we would have the right stance and that we would stand still and that we would be able to come at the end of this new year and be able to rehearse to one another the goodness of God, how that he fought and how that he gave the victory. For I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good, is he not? I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to end right here since I've gone past the time that's allotted to me. But uh, that's my challenge. Read. There was a lot of other things God gave me, but that's the two truths God with Bill. Because that's why stance, be still. And uh, God wants to do some great things in our life. Remember next week, um, ba Pastor Matt will be starting a new series. And really, if you're going to live that life, life of purpose, you've got to be that stance. you got to be still before God. Well, God bless you. hope you have a great, great uh, last day of 2023. And may God prove his faithfulness in your life in the midst of circumstances you find yourself. God bless and be safe.